On the night of June 17, 1462, the soldiers of Vlad III rode into the Ottoman camp with the aim of assassinating the Sultan. Chaos ensued. If this seems like a particularly bold maneuver, we should expect no less from the inspiration behind Dracula, the blood-sucking vampire. Whilst the movies and books have sensationalized his life, the real-life story of Vlad the Impaler is no less interesting, especially his contest against the Ottomans. His biggest foe happened to be a titan of history in his own right, none other than Sultan Mehmet II, given the nickname Fatih, or conqueror for his conquest of Constantinople. This is Dracula vs Mehmet the Conqueror. This video is a part of a two-part series in collaboration with History with Hilbert who focuses on the life of Vlad the Impaler. Definitely check out his video as he will be focusing on separating fact from fiction about the man who inspired Dracula. The link to that video is in the bio to this video. First, we have to understand the geopolitical reality that Wallachia must have faced in the 15th century. For more on that, we go to history with Hilbert. Nestled between the Danube River and the Carpathian Mountains, 15th century Wallachia was a contested space between the two dominant powers of southeastern Europe, the Kingdom of Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. The allegiance of the Wallachian Voivod, aka leader, would fluctuate between these two regional giants. Vlad II, the Wallachian Voivod until 1447, had previously been initiated into the Order of the Dragon, which was created to defend Christian Europe against the Ottoman Empire. Subsequently, he was known as Vlad Dracul, or the Dragon, and his sons, the future Vlad the Impaler being one of them, would be known as Dracula, or the son of Dracul. Thanks for that, Hilbert. After some yo-yoing between allying himself with the Hungarians and then the Ottomans, Vlad II was forced to send his two sons, Radu and Vlad, to the Ottomans in order to secure his loyalty. The two young princes would spend the next four years as prisoners. In this time, Vlad came into contact with the man who would go on to become his greatest enemy, the young Prince Mehmet. When Vlad II was assassinated by allies of the influential Hungarian regent Jonas Hunyadi in 1447, the Ottomans released his son Vlad from captivity to contest the Wallachian throne because they believed he would be friendly to their cause. Vlad's fate fluctuated for the next eight years before finally becoming voivod for the second time in 1456. In the meantime, Sultan Mehmet had ascended the throne conquered the legendary city of Constantinople and seemed ready to expand Ottoman presence in the Balkans. After three years of paying tribute to Sultan Mehmet, in 1459 Vlad decided to stop paying the customary money and young recruits. He may have pinned his hopes on the prospect of a united Christian effort against the Ottomans in the shape of a crusade. This would not have been new. Remember, in the 1440s, there were two crusades against the Ottomans. But in 1459, the Christian kings and princes of Europe were too preoccupied with their own affairs for foreign adventures, and so nothing came of Pope Pius II's call for a crusade. This was not good news for Vlad. During this time, Mehmet was more focused on finishing off the last remnants of the Byzantine Empire in Trebizond and the Maria in Greece. Still, Ottoman raiding parties, aka razias, into Wallachia and Vlad's reprisals against Ottoman areas simply fueled the inevitability of a major face-off in the end. Late in 1461, Sultan Mehmet and Vlad seemed to have reconciled. Kind of. Vlad informed the Sultan that he did not have the money to pay him, but he could pay him in children and horses. So the Sultan sent an emissary, Hamza Pasha, to Vlad's capital at Targoviste for negotiations. But Wallachia's position in between two major powers would see it once again embroiled in intrigues, because Mehmet discovered Vlad was secretly having discussions with the Hungarian king Matthias Corvinus. So Hamza Pasha set a trap for Vlad by inviting him to Giorgio, an Ottoman-controlled city on the Danube. But Vlad was far more cunning than his blood-sucking portrayal as a vampire would have you believe. In the five or so years he had been leader, 
he had centralized authority in his realm, albeit brutally, and advanced the capacity of his government by restructuring administration. So it shouldn't surprise us too much to know that Vlad found out about Hamza Pasha's trap. Vlad set up an ambush of his own, capturing Hamza Pasha and his 1,000 soldiers, before moving on Giorgio. There he managed to get the Ottoman garrison to open the gates to the fortress by disguising himself and speaking fluent Turkish, surely picked up during his time as a prisoner. After killing everyone inside the fortress, he spent the winter of 1461 and 1462 campaigning in southern Wallachia and even northern Bulgaria after he crossed the frozen Danube. Targeting Ottoman sympathizers and Turks, Vlad proudly proclaimed in a letter to the Hungarian king that he had killed 23,884 Turks, and that was not including those who were burned in their homes or those who were beheaded. Thousands of Turks fled south, bringing with them horrific stories that only served to spread panic in the empire. Sultan Mehmed could not allow such an affront to his authority. He was also worried about the prospect of a united European Christian war against him. The conflict now became too big for him to delegate to his viziers and governors, especially after word got back to him that the King of Hungary had given soldiers to Vlad. A joint Hungarian Wallachian front required his presence, so he personally led an army of up to 50,000 soldiers into Wallachia. Vlad could only field an army of 15 or 20,000, so he could not fight the mighty Ottomans head on. By May 1462, Sultan Mehmet was on his way. By this time, the Danube melted, and Mehmet also made use of his navy, which reinforced him when he was crossing the Danube. On June 1st, the Ottomans were ready to cross the Danube, with Vlad's forces right there to make the landing as difficult as possible. But by June 4th, Mehmet's forces crossed into Wallachia and Vlad had to back off. The summer of 1462 was particularly hot, so Mehmet decided to march on Vlad's capital at Targoviste through the Vlasia forest. Vlad strategically placed contingents of his troops in the forest in order to carry out guerrilla warfare. Vlad had also moved the population and livestock of southern Wallachia up north so that the invading Ottomans would be deprived of living off the land. After two weeks, Mehmet's forces emerged out of the forest, not too far from Targoviste. On the night of June 17th, Vlad's daring and boldness almost shocked the world. Vlad decided, in order to defeat the Ottomans, he had to take out their leader, so he concocted a plan which targeted none other than Sultan Mehmet. In the evening of June 17th, Vlad took a few thousand of his elite soldiers to attack the Ottoman camp, which was resting outside of his capital. We don't know exactly how Vlad knew where Sultan Mehmet was, was it his knowledge of the Ottomans, or had he tortured the information out of Ottoman captives? Splitting his forces in two, Vlad spearheaded the attack himself, undoubtedly taking the Ottomans by surprise. Swinging torches and sounding off their buglers, the Wallachians slaughtered countless unaware Ottoman soldiers. But this was not a war of attrition. Vlad's aim was to assassinate Mehmet, so he pushed on for the Sultan's position, which was understandably in the most fortified place in the whole camp. Thankfully for the Ottomans, Mehmet was saved by his janissaries who surrounded his position and held the Wallachians before pushing them off in the early hours of the next day. Vlad was failed by the other half of his force, which never appeared, so he decided to flee the scene to fight another day. In all, it is estimated that 15,000 Ottoman soldiers were killed and 5,000 Wallachians. As potentially damaging as this battle was for the Ottomans, Vlad incurred devastating casualties considering his limited resources in the first place. Unsurprisingly, Sultan Mehmet's troops entered Targoviste a few days later to find an abandoned city. Upon leaving the city, Mehmet and his men saw a sight that none of them would ever forget. Standing before them was a two miles long forest of impaled bodies. 20,000 Turks impaled, with Hamza Pasha having the dubious honor of being impaled on the highest stake. And now you know where the name Vlad the Impaler comes from. But just as I have been saying that Vlad understood the Ottomans well, 
the same compliment must be extended to Mehmet and his understanding of Wallachi and politics. He had brought Radu, Vlad's younger brother, with him on the campaign to contest the Wallachian throne. As Mehmet was getting ready to leave for Edirne, Radu was left behind to win support for his cause, which turned out wasn't very hard considering his brother Vlad's heavy-handed tactics left many of the Wallachian nobility alienated. Within a few months, Vlad was betrayed by his former ally, the King of Hungary, and imprisoned for the next 13 years. But Vlad the Impaler's story does not end there. He would find his way back to the Wallachian throne, holding it only for a month or two at the end of 1476 before being killed in a battle with an Ottoman-backed candidate for his throne. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this collaboration between Hikma History and History with Hilbert. I've really enjoyed it. Leave a comment below who else you would like me to collaborate with. In the meantime, make sure to like, comment and subscribe. And don't forget to check out the Patreon page if you want to see Hikma History grow. The link is in the bio. Until next time, peace.